I want to accomplish some financial things that can really move some stuff around. If you really want to change the world, the best way to do that is to get a lot of money. And I'm not talking about a little bit of money. I'm talking about a lot of money. We like to glorify the fact that if you give your time and you give your energy and maybe you're charismatic, you can change the world. And there's been some examples of that MLK, Gandhi, some people like that. The rest of the people who shape the world that we're in today shape the world because they're very wealthy. All right, Colin, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited for today. This is, I've been excited for this one. Awesome. Well, we've got Nick Huber on today. And Nick was born in Leopold, Indiana. He attended Cornell University, where he excelled in track and founded Storage Squad. With his partner, they expanded the business to 25 major college towns before selling it in early 2021. After the sale, Nick turned his focus to real estate, private equity, and self-storage operations, rapidly growing his portfolio. Currently owns and manages 63 self-storage locations across 11 states, totaling 1.9 million square feet. His estimated real estate portfolio value ranges from 150 to $200 million. Alongside his entrepreneurial ventures, Nick actively engages with a thriving online community of like-minded individuals sharing valuable content through social media, a weekly email newsletter with over 100,000 subscribers, and hosting two popular podcasts with over 300 episodes recorded. Nick, how'd I do in your bio? I think that's about it. We can close it down. It was great. It was great. Awesome. <laughs> Mic drop. All right. Talk to you next week. <laughs> Maybe uh, most known for uh, your presence on Twitter. What do you think people uh, know you best for? Which of your business opportunities or businesses have you started or what you're doing online? Like, what do you think people uh, know you for? I think the controversial takes is kind of what the masses know me as. But I think my plan throughout Twitter, all my writing, all my stuff out there on social media is to be vulnerable, be a little bit contrary uh, to popular belief, and then a certain percentage of people will jive with that. And I've, I've kind of always accepted that not everybody will agree with me. Not everybody will jive perfectly with me, but some people really will. And those are the ones I'm after. So I have a superpower for over time, not caring as much about what every single person thinks about me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I personally love the tiny deck tweets, the, the lovely bourbon tweets as well. I just, I, every time I see these, I just, I'm like, oh man, this is going to be good. Let's grab the popcorn and let's see these people get riled up. So I personally appreciate it uh, for what it's worth. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, uh, when people uh, ask you what you do, if you meet someone at the golf course or with your friends or family, when they ask you, what do you do? What do you say? I say that I'm in real estate and we buy and operate self-storage facilities. It's the easiest thing for folks to understand. And if the conversation, most people just ask that to be polite and they don't really care yeah. at all. So I don't want to, I kind of just feed that out there. And if they do care and they want to learn a little bit more about me, then I'll talk about some of my other businesses and uh, probably bring up Twitter last just because I don't, most, a lot of my friends don't know that I tweet much and don't really care. So I think that's kind of cool. Interesting. It's like an alternate persona on Twitter. I, I kind of feel the same way. I, I kind of hope my family never looks on Twitter and sees what I do. But so you've done a lot on the different terms of like the real estate side and then on Twitter I've been following and there's a number of companies that you've kind of. So I think one of the interesting, we talked to angel investors and really people investing in early stage companies. And so I'd be interested to, to learn more about kind of your take on investing in private companies, because I think you both have a an energy component to it that you put into it and both an equity mm -hmm. component. And I'd love to hear your kind of your journey to getting to that strategy. I was very fascinated about entrepreneurship from a public media persona of it for a long time. I read the Steve Jobs books. I read the Elon Musk biography. I read the, the PayPal mafias, all their books on startups and investing and how to do this stuff. Right. And I think that like, they, look, they're really good at it and they have the track record to prove that it really works. I then went around and said, okay, I'm going to do a little bit of angel investing and I'm going to go to the local college here and, and judge some pitch competitions. And I'm going to go to some networking events in Atlanta with tech startup vibe. And I just found that the more and more I listened to people talk about their ideas and their startups, I just kept kind of arguing back for simplicity. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? It's like they wanted to, they didn't just want to start a recruiting company and make really good money like hundreds and uh, uh, thousands of recruiting companies in America do, they wanted to flip recruiting on its head. That's a great example because I started a recruiting company. I don't think the model needs flipped on its head. 
I think it's a very profitable model for people who own recruiting agencies. And that's, oh, I want to revolutionize home services. I want to revolutionize how people do X, Y, and Z. And I just kept finding myself standing up at these meetings and saying, what's the matter with it as it is? <laughs> like, this is innovation for the sake of innovation. These companies are great companies. The customers get their service. Like, it, it, it works. What is out there in the world works. And I see so many brilliant entrepreneurs. And I guess we got to rewind and say, like, to start a world-changing, highly successful company, you need three things. You need a ton of talent, operational talent. That's like the skill set around it, the, the sales, the charisma, the management, the delegation. You need capital, you need cash, and then you need a network. You need to be able to go out and find who your partners are and who your customers are going to be and who your employees are going to be. As a new entrepreneur, as a entrepreneur, you have none of those things. Mm. So I kept seeing these people who wanted to start tech startups and do really solve really hard problems, but they didn't have any of the ingredients required to actually solve really hard problems. So I kept wanting to say, shut the computer, go outside, touch <laughs> some grass, look around your neighborhood at all the companies that are making really great money in your town today. So that, that kind of shifted my lens. And then I started going around to the country clubs, going to the nice restaurants, hanging out with real business owners with real wealth, with flying around jets to their beach houses. And none of them started new, big idea, revolutionary companies. None of them. <laughs> so I was like, hold on. The media is portraying world-changing, groundbreaking technology, innovation, sexy stuff. Like we're reading about it. We're looking at Shark Tank. We're watching Product Hunt. The real world, all the wealthy people that I know went a different direction. So it's hard for me to you know, put those two things together in my mind. Yeah, I think there's definitely something there. Why do you think it is that people sort of look up to the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musk? Why does everyone want to be like, why is that path so sexy, do you think, in your mind? I think, I mean, the same, let, let's reframe this. Why is there a 28-year-old at a golf course right now who got out of college five years ago who still is trying to make it to become a pro golfer. It's the gladiator in the arena. It's the sexiness of the story. It's the against all odds American dream. Like yeah. That's why they watch a show on XYZ, whoever, and they see just the overcome all odds from bagging groceries to Kurt Warner, Sur Super Bowl MVP. And those stories are moving. They pull out emotions. They pull out the ego, the drive, the overcoming all odds, the courage, and they leave everybody with this, oh, that can be me. That can be yeah. me. I can do this. Why did you pick the, the Twitter handle Sweaty Startup? Because I, I remember when I first started following you, I kind of imagined that you're more of a tech guy, investor, and then I started following you and I'm like, oh, this guy's talking about real estate and building a business and kind of everything like, like you just laid out, not really the tech path. Yeah, I think if more people got excited about getting out and sweating a little bit, and, and it can be just doing a lot of hard, boring work, that's sweaty too. Mm -hmm. If more people went that direction with entrepreneurship, I think a lot more people would be wealthy. A lot more really smart people try to go the against all odds way, the sexy way, the walk around Silicon Valley in some sweatpants way because they raised 10 or $20 million. Less people are willing to buy a box truck and move boxes. That's how I got my start. I got my start literally sweating by carrying mm. boxes up and down spiral staircases. And it's all about like the goals that you start. And if you wanna, if you wanna have a, a public IPO, you wanna be glorified in these magazines and in social media, you gotta go one direction. But if you wanna kind of maximize your odds of success, you can get out and sweat and do a little bit of hard work. And I think that's the preferred method for me. Yeah. So our, our last guest, well, I don't know if it's our last guest, but one of our guests, uh, Stevie, I won't say her last name. She's just Stevie McTweets on Twitter. She, she, I think grew up a dairy farmer. And so her lens on kind of the venture world and all of this is like non-traditional tech, but more of like, how does this work with middle America? That's like her lens. And uh, mm -hmm. I know you're from Georgia. I live in Texas. I'm, I'm from Alaska. My first job was cleaning fish on the, the slime line because my parents owned a fishing company. But do you think like your vantage point from like, literally the middle of America in the South, like changes kind of how you perceive, like, I don't know, the West Coast or East Coast companies that are coming out, just in terms of like access to capital and what they're trying to solve. I think the 
a, a very good practice for a founder, an entrepreneur, somebody who's interested in entrepreneurship, it should be required reading for them to go hang out in a Walmart for 12 hours. Like that is America. That is hmm. the average person. Like there, there's these meme accounts on Twitter, like the people of Walmart. Uh, newsflash, like the average American, the 50th percentile median person in American cannot withstand a five, $500 surprise expense. They don't have anything saved. They rent their home. They're trying to figure out how to put gas in their car. They're trying to figure out how to do enough work at their job to not lose their job and get paid next Friday so they can feed their kids. And we have all these brilliant tech people who like they're in a new, they're in a different world. They're in a totally different world. Their needs are different. Their wants are different. Their goals are different and they're solving problems for themselves. And when you get to Walmart, when you go in Walmart and when you think about America and the average American, these are not problems. <laughs> these are not <laughs> problems for the average person. You start to go around a town, any town, anywhere in America, and you start to see that people spend 98% of their time in buildings, yet nobody's talking about all the maintenance, building, cleaning, work that's required to keep these buildings inhabitable and remodel them every 10 years. And all those needs, massive part of the economy that is the service sector, nobody talks about that stuff because they're not the ones that are shopping at Walmart and they're not the ones that are riding their bikes on the back roads of Georgia and seeing people living <laughs> in trailers with tarps on top of the roof. And not because the tarps, not because there was a tree that fell on the house yesterday, that tarp's been there for three years because that family's in such poverty, they can't put a new roof on their home. Yeah. Well, I, I love the uh, passion that you bring for your, you know, sort of sweaty startups, middle America. Let's talk a little bit about your investment journey strategy and sort of what you're up to now. What was your first uh, real investment in your mind? I have, I've made very few significant cash investments, mainly mm -hmm. one, one big one. And that was to build our first self-storage facility. That was in 2015. They opened the doors in 2017, 2017, so it was a two-year development cycle. And that was money that we had set aside from our little old sweaty startup. We had 500 grand, we were 25 years old and wide-eyed, and we invested almost all that capital, including a personal guarantee on the dotted line with a bank to build a building from the ground up in upstate New York. But other than no that, I've, I've bought some equities and I have started companies that are very low risk. I've made, I've made very few high-risk potential 10 X investments. I don't think I've ever made one. Hmm. What, what type of companies have you started that are low risk? I mentioned recruiting. I think the model a business model of a recruiting company is phenomenal. I mean, one person can mm -hmm. go find talent on by hammering around on LinkedIn and pre-screening a bunch of candidates and get 20, 30% of somebody's salary to place them with the company. I mean, that's high, that's high value work, thousands of dollars an hour at times to be a very good recruiter. That's a good business. Property and casualty insurance is a really good business. People bought, people get insurance quotes and on their properties and they pay these insurance premiums for years and years while the person who originated the loan officer is out playing golf. I know so many <laughs> 300 plus thousand dollar year earners in the insurance business and all they do is play golf. That, that in my mind is another sign of a great business. So like <laughs> where do people make really good money by not working that hard or not doing anything that spectacular? That's a good business. Why, uh, why disrupt that? Like, why not just do it? Yeah, I, having built an insurance company from the ground up in the RV space, I have a pretty a nice view of that as well. I was like, oh, this is interesting. You get paid up front and on renewal once you write this business, <laughs> and if you take risk over time, like so, we started as like a it's called Romley as a as an agent, and then we eventually came an MGA and started taking serious not risk, and it's like, man. If you have a good loss run business, like you're talking in the PNC, property and casualty for those people out there, like those, like you're, you're right, there's some people just mint and around here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, talk, huh? no, it's, <laughs> it's interesting because I do, I agree with Nick in the sense that they are a low cost investment in the sense that like, what do you literally need is your sales hustle is to go out and do that. You need to go find customers that need a policy and that's pretty much it. You don't need some like heavy tech, like these insurance companies will give it to you. Um, here's a good, so, here's a good way to put it. I think to, yeah. to expand on that a little bit longer, what areas are people making really good money and they're not that smart and they don't work that hard. <laughs> that's <Real a> good. <laughs> Where is the highest concentration of dumb, rich people? 
Mm. And I'm going to go after those businesses. It's real estate, number one. Like real estate people, they they build up a portfolio. They can build it large enough in a couple of years where they never have to work again. They walk around playing golf and doing whatever they want. Why in the world would I go compete with Stanford grads to change the world and raise capital and be in the most competitive environment ever? It's like I, I'm playing. I'm about to play a basketball game, and if I win the basketball game, I get ten million dollars, and I get to mm. choose who I play against. Am I going to choose to play against? LeBron James or my third grade cousin. <laughs> There's people out there who are brilliant operators, brilliant entrepreneurs. They say, oh, I want to change the world so bad that they're going to say, I want to play basketball against LeBron James. And yes, 999 times out of 1,000, I'm going to lose. Where there's a third grade cousin on the court over that nobody's watching that you can go dunk right on. It's a six-foot <laughs> goal. Property Ooh. casualty insurance. Loan officers don't work very hard. <laughs> Recruiters. They're, like It's distribution. If you can get distribution figured out, you can make a boatload of money in the recruiting business, property and casualty insurance, real estate, on and on down the list. There's just really good business models in existence. We don't need to will new business models into existence. So what I'm hearing is green pastures versus bloody oceans. That's what I'm hearing. Actually, I'll go, after for the, you. I'll go after the bloody oceans. Oh. Like I don't agree okay. with the blue ocean strategy, I think is kind of telling people, hey, go create your own market, be the only one in a market, be mm -hmm. the monopoly, right? I am perfectly fine to go compete in very competitive areas. And if I only need to get my slice of the pie to win, like there's Andrew Wilkinson and his partner, they're playing at a different level. They say there's two lakes, right? There's two lakes. There's a lake with a lot of fishermen in it. And there's a lake without fishermen. Naturally, the entrepreneurial books, the media will say, go fish where the fishermen are not. I'm saying, those are fishermen. Those are professional fishermen for a reason. They need to feed their families. They are where the fish are. I'm going to go park my boat right next to them, and I'm going to drop my line in the water. No, that makes sense. So in terms of, like, investing, like, from a cash perspective or anything like that, like, what are the types of businesses that you would invest in? Like, what, where is the – what's the set of things that you would be like, I wish I could have invested cash in that or I would have gone after I think the big, the large scale plan for me, and I've started a business brokerage recently, and I'm starting to get a feel for buying and selling companies. I'm also starting to focus on my personal cash flow and getting that to a level where I can take bigger swings, seven figure investments to potentially buy companies. I want to have a controlling interest in a lot of different businesses. And I know hold co and holding company is a real sexy word that's going around Twitter. People who just want to own a bunch of cash flowing companies, myself, Cody, Sanchez, several others have kind of brought those things to the attention of others. But like, that is what small scale private equity is. That's what Brent Bishore is doing. That's what Andrew Wilkinson is doing. Like we're not buying world changing companies. We're not running world changing companies. We're just buying good ones and we're pulling some levers where I, I want to build a portfolio of companies first, a foundation. That's what I'm working on now of like levers that I can pull in my own companies. Okay. I got my own SEO firm, got my own web development firm, got my own Latin American and Filipino recruiting firm, got my own American recruiting firm got my own pay-per-click performance marketing company. Those six companies are the levers that can amplify my other companies that I buy. So building that groundwork now, finding the best operators to part with, partner with, and I'm becoming customers in all of my businesses of my other businesses. I'm going to build that foundation up, build my cash flow up. And in four or five, 10 years, whatever it is, I want to be able to buy companies, install operators, and supercharge those companies with my own companies. Yeah. So I think the playbook that you're laying out is really clear. And I think you talk about it a lot on Twitter. You sort of are very open. And I think that's what a lot of people love about you, at least the ones who love you. And what motivates you though? Like, what's your goal? Like if you've obviously shown like, Hey, you can do real estate, you can build a business, you can hire people. You're good at these skills. Now you're doing it like seven times. Like, what do you get out of like the seventh time building that service business that you're now a customer of that you didn't get in like the first or second time? I think the motivating factor for me was an interchange, an exchange that I've had probably 20 or 30 times with different operators on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And the argument is always the same. It's, I want to build, I want to operate business at the highest level. This is my goal. I want to operate business at the highest level. I want to play the game at a very high level. And I also want to have a balanced life. I want to have great relationships with my kids. I want to be a great mm -hmm. husband. I want to have a ton of hobbies. I want to become a scratch golfer. I want to become a pilot. I want to do these things that are not business related. So therefore, I need to be able to work 20 to 30 hours a week. People on Twitter that are very rich, that are very good at what they do, 
they call me out all the time and tell me that is complete bullshit. You cannot do that. You are not your, in so many words, they're saying you're lazy. You're not obsessed with your business. The only way to play this game at the highest level, maybe it's become a billionaire, whatever it might be. The only way to do that is with a level of unbalance. Mm -hmm. I want to prove them wrong more than anything in the world. And I'm kind of speaking it into existence that, hey, I'm going to delegate to the extreme. I'm a gatherer of people. I'm going to find talented people and put them together. And I can play this game at the highest level. I can make massive amounts of money. And I can build teams of people that I'm making them wealthy. Another personal goal of mine is, hey, I want to make a lot of millionaires. Like I want a lot of my partners, my employees, my investors, I want to make them a ton of money and accelerate their life too. And the best way to do that is just grow bigger and bigger. So that's kind of where I'm at, what motivates you right now. Yeah, I definitely love the idea. I mean, I've hired people over the years, over the past 10 years running my business, and they're, they definitely haven't become millionaires from me. But you know, one or two of them have bought a house and some of them have been afforded like a full time income. And I think even on a small scale, that's kind of cool to be able to provide for someone's family. What haven't you checked off? though? I mean, you said operate at the highest level, feel like you're doing that feel like you have a pretty balanced life sounds like you're working 20 to 30 hours a week, you're always talking about golf. So I assume you play a lot. I see you with your kids a lot on social media, at least. So it seems like you're kind of checking all the boxes is it the money piece you want to be a billionaire instead of a multimillionaire? yeah i want to accomplish some financial things that can really move some stuff around i think if you really want to change the world the best way to do that is to get a lot of money and i'm not talking about a little bit of money i'm talking about a lot of money the people who we like to glorify the fact that if you give your time and you give your energy and and maybe you're charismatic you can change the world and there's been some examples of that mlk gandhi some people like that The rest of the people who shape the world that we're in today shape the world because they're very wealthy, period. Money moves mountains. Money has a positive or negative effect on the world. It amplifies whichever way you're going as a human being. And so, yeah, I want to make a lot more money so that I can positively impact more and more people. I like that. The noble goal. So one of the questions I always like to ask people is because people talk about their good investments and things like that. But what's one of your worst investments? What what have you learned there? We've had a couple storage deals that are just, when you buy 25 deals in two years, you have a couple that are not going to hit projections. And so we have 21 deals that are doing well. We have four deals that are hanging on and we have one deal that's not good. <laughs> and it's just, <laughs> it's the nature, it's the nature of the game. We're not going to lose the property. And I'm confident that in five years, it, it will turn out eventually to be a good outcome. But yeah, we bought a dud property in our real estate private equity company. That always leads to some stress. We've owned it almost a year. It's still at, it's at 48% occupancy right now, which is embarrassing. So <laughs> that, yeah. go ahead. Maybe talk to us like what, what keeps something at low occupancy like that? I, I know nothing about storage units other than I've stored some things in some storage units, but I see it. It's hot to invest in somewhat like car washes. Um, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that nobody's having fun in the real estate business right now. When interest rates go from three and a half percent when deals are selling, we're buying things. I'm a syndicator of funds, right? I'm not dumping my mm-hmm. own cash into, into mm-hmm. deals. So I get paid a percentage of the upside and I get paid to do deals. I'm getting fees to buy properties, to, to place money. It's hard to buy properties. We're not doing big refis and we're sure as hell not going to sell any properties anytime soon. So it is not fun to be in my position managing a big real estate portfolio. So yeah, the just real estate in general, the the headwinds are massive. Less people are selling and buying homes, which is a big driver of self-storage rentals. And we had a lot of development. A a big property was developed by a big REIT right around the corner from where we bought our property right afterwards. And they're outspending us on marketing. They're outspending us on lease up. Their SEO is better than our SEO. So it's just a uh, tough break on that one. I appreciate the honesty on that one. It's like super interesting. I'm no expert in real estate. So I'm not going to pretend like I know anything there, but so one of the other questions we like to ask folks folks that come on is like, if you were starting over again, what advice would you give yourself at the beginning? I had a ace up my sleeve and a competitive advantage when I was starting. And that was that I didn't know and study and obsess over entrepreneurship. I didn't follow the really rich people. I didn't read the biographies. I didn't think I needed to change the world or scale. I didn't know what scale was. I didn't know what a moat was. And I didn't know what venture capital was when I started my company. And I think that's, I, I, looking back, I think it was a blessing. Like I was lucky. I was lucky that I didn't 
obsess over the next giant big thing because then I wouldn't have gotten excited about the small stuff. So my advice to all the people starting out is like, stop glorifying the really rich people. Stop glorifying the people who have defied all the odds and the gladiators in the arena who have built the massive companies and just get excited about the little stuff. Start really small goals, go make a little bit of money. So I was running around as a 21 year old getting excited about sweating up and down spiral staircases to make $200. Like that was exciting to me. The business wasn't scalable. It was low barrier to entry. It was a, a tough logistical business, but I was excited to be in the game. I was excited to hire people. I was excited to get started. And if I didn't know where I was going to end up and that it was going to take 10 years to really like get some momentum and get it to where I was not working as much and having more leverage and making bigger decisions and having more fun and building bigger businesses, I would have given up and I would have probably tried to go too big too fast and I would have failed and got a job. Yeah. I, I love the, it's almost like you didn't know what you didn't know. So that was your, your secret power in some ways. I like it. All right. Right on. Well, Nick, I feel like this episode was jam packed and we could probably talk to you for a lot longer, but I want to end it right here. And it's like, boom, massive value for everyone that's listening and really appreciate you coming on. So if people want to follow you, learn from you, sweaty startup on Twitter, you've got newsletters, where else should they go? Yeah. I think I want to caveat all this that I'm saying, like I have very let her rip. Yeah. I have very <laughs> strong opinions, right? I have, I have very strong opinions. I change my mind a lot. You'll hear me three years from now and I might be taking a different stance on things and business is incredibly nuanced. There's thousands mm -hmm. of ways to win. Your skill set's different than my skill set. So I don't want to seem like I'm just poo pooing on an entire industry here. I, I know what I don't know. I know what works for me. And to me, I have a hammer in my hand and everything is a nail, right? So people keep that in mind when you're listening to me. But I think the best way is my email newsletter. I write a really thoughtful 1,000 plus word email every week about management, about delegation, about real estate, about hiring people, about wealth building. And, and you can sign nice. up for that on SwayStartup.com. And you can follow cool. me on Twitter at Sway Startup. All right, sweet. We'll leave a, a link to that. And I see on your landing page too, you've got a bunch of other links to your real estate show and your podcast and all that good stuff. And looks like a lot of your businesses too. So appreciate you coming on, Nick, and we'll see you on Twitter. Harry, Colin, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.